a subject that is not without a little bit of controversy sometimes in some circles, but in apostolic churches, we embrace the fivefold ministry, even though sometimes we don't understand it fully and completely. So my goal tonight is to help you understand what the Bible calls the fivefold ministry, maybe a little bit better. That's my prayer tonight. Jesus never said to us, he never said, go win souls. He never said that. What he said was, go make disciples. The only time win souls is even used in the Bible is in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, where it says this. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So the only reference we have to winning souls is in the Old Testament when obviously the New Testament church hasn't even begun. So that's not win souls in the sense that we think of it today. Even our favorite soul winning verse, which is right there. In fact, it's the only soul winning verse. Uh, it's not about traditional soul winning methods. But we need those methods in the New Testament. We still need to be witnesses. We still need to knock doors and maybe pass literature and teach Bible studies and do everything that we do. But this verse is talking about something different than the sense of salvation. You might even say, and this isn't a word, this isn't right grammar, so we'll do it just because we need to. Um, it's not so much about soul winning. It's about soul withing being with somebody. You see, what that verse is saying is that people have to be close enough to a righteous person to eat the fruit that grows from their life. And when they see the fruit and when they taste the fruit that grows from your life, then they will want to follow God like you follow God. So it is kind of like soul winning, but in an Old Testament sense. The New Testament word would be discipleship. And uh, the church is supposed to be uh, family-centered, not factory-driven. Um, this isn't a machine that we come to and engage in every week. Jesus taught us more than soul winning, that you make a presentation and like a salesperson, you win them to your opinion. Jesus talked about discipleship, which is uh, the power of soul withing, if you will, being with people and, and helping them and watching them grow. A family uses a whole different set of metrics to measure its success. Families don't measure success like the metrics used by a factory. Factories are about production and repetition and streamlining things. The bottom line for factories is to increase value and volume for its ownership. But for families, they focus on the quality of relationships not just the quantity of production. And so the church is a family. Developing products to be used, that is the purpose of a factory. But developing babies to adulthood, that is the passion of a family. And that happens only through being with people, being close to people, developing relationship with people, or what Jesus called discipleship. Much of the material that we read today on spiritual growth and every minister here, we've got several of them in the congregation tonight uh, that have pastored and led and we've got, uh, you know, missionaries. We've got everybody here. And, and every leader in the church, every pastor, we've read the books, we've read the material on spiritual growth and it all talks about practices. This is how you need to develop processes and practices so people can grow spiritually. But if you fast forward through somebody's life and you ask them later in life what shaped their spiritual life, their relationship with God, they will not respond with a practice. They will not say it was that lesson or it was that technique or it was that. No, they'll respond almost always with the name of a person. Almost always, if you think about your life, there's a person or persons who shaped you spiritually. And you sit here tonight, the product of discipleship. You sit here tonight, the product of soul withing. Somebody was with you on your journey and they impacted you and you honored them. That, brothers and sisters, is discipleship. It's not any more complicated than that. 
Building a church is more than just having the right pieces in place. It's about having the right people in the right places. And thankfully, the scripture tells us how we do that in the apostolic church. And that brings me to our subject tonight. Paul writes to the Ephesian church, a powerful, powerful church in Ephesus. It was a regional church. It impacted uh, just the whole Roman province of, of Asia was impacted by this church. And the church in Ephesus, here's what he wrote. And he gave some, God gave some, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. That's what we call fivefold. That's the fivefold ministry in the church. And that was given as a gift to the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature or complete or equipped man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, if you look at that little passage, the first verse, verse 11, refers to the five-fold ministry. Five types of leaders or five types of giftings that God gives to his church. But please note that the next verse, which begins with, for the perfecting of the saints, verse uh, 12 is not the threefold job description of the fivefold ministry, that the fivefold ministry, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors, teachers, they are supposed to uh, do all of this. They're supposed to perfect the saints. They're supposed to do the work of the ministry. They're supposed to edify the body of Christ. It doesn't work like that. Actually, verse 12 gives us uh, the, the one job description of the fivefold ministry. And then it tells us how that works down through the church. And it goes like this, that the fivefold ministry, those five gifts given to the church, they are for the perfecting, the maturing, the completing, the equipping of the saints, comma. And then when the saints are matured, when the saints are completed and equipped, then the saints do the work of the ministry. And when saints do the work of the ministry. The body of Christ is edified. Edified means to be built up, to be strengthened. So if we want to build the church, if we want to strengthen the church, if we want to grow the church, we need two things. We need these five gifts, fivefold. We need that operating in the church, but we also need uh, every one of you. Faithful saints of God that just serve God, love their church, love God's word, and they just want their life to matter. Their one and only solitary life, the only life they have to live, they want it to matter for the kingdom of God. And so we need all of that in order. And that's the structure. That's what built the very influential regional church in the city of Ephesus that ended up in the entire Roman province of Asia hearing the word of the Lord. Now, so... Here, here's my point tonight. These giftings, these five-fold ministry giftings, some people call them offices. Uh, I'm going to call them giftings tonight, although I may go back and forth. But these giftings indicate individuals. You can probably think of something if you've been, someone, if you've been around the apostolic church very long and you think they're an evangelist or they're a teacher or they're a prophet or whatever, you can probably think of that if you've been around very long. So these gifts indicate individuals. However, we live in a celebrity fascinated culture. And so what we tend to do in our celebrity fascinated culture is we try to make superstars out of people in the church like they make superstars out of people in sports or in Hollywood or in politics or in any other field. And that's not biblical because there's no big shots in the kingdom of God and then all the little people like us. There's just saints of God. Being a saint is the highest and most important job description in the kingdom of God. Nothing else even comes close. When you get to heaven, you're not getting there because you had your name on a poster somewhere to preach a camp meeting. You're going to be there because you're a child of the King of Kings with your sins covered by his blood, filled with his spirit, baptized in his name. You're getting there because you're a saint of God. And everything else that you do is because you're a saint. So, so these are individuals. God gives giftings to the church and, and they're often in the person of an individual. However, it's not the individual that's so important. 
It's not the individual that we need to glorify. It's not the individual that we need to put on a pedestal. In fact, I would hazard uh, this, this observation tonight, and if you disagree, that's fine, but I believe that these five giftings are not just given uh, so that we can pick out individuals and try to figure out who's who. They are given so that five major kingdom initiatives become established in every church. So the five-fold gifts, they come through people that God anoints and appoints, but they are not to glorify those individuals so that we can say prophet so-and-so or apostle so-and-so. They are to uh, establish five kingdom initiatives. And those five initiatives, they stand like five pillars on which we build the church, the church local and the church universal. And if you lose one or two pillars, it creates the potential for weakness or collapse. Now, these five pillars, let me just make some generic comments and then we'll dive in. They're not merely personality traits. Every preacher that screams, hollers, spits, and jumps is not a prophet. Okay, uh, or an evangelist. It's not a personality trait. Uh, it's not some kind of trait that a particular minister possesses. Uh, everybody that has like beady eyes and big ears and, and, and like just that stern face, they're not a prophet. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, just because they look like they're mad or they ate something that disagreed with their stomach before they preached, that doesn't mean they're an apostle or whatever. Everybody breathe, okay? <laughs> just, just relax. You're sucking all the oxygen out of the room. It's making it hot. So it's not personality traits of a particular ministry. It's not of even characteristics of a particular congregation. These five giftings are the DNA of Christ's body because he is the one who gave these gifts to us. And so these elements, these initiatives, these giftings must be present in uh, every apostolic church. Certainly there are seasons of ministry in a church or even in uh, someone's individual ministry where uh, one area may need to be emphasized more than the others. And as congregations like ours participate in the larger body of Christ, we may find that our church is stronger in one area and another church is stronger in another area and that's all fine because that's why we're part of the body in the first place and the body is bigger than CCC on Downing Street in Fredericton. The body of Christ spans the globe. It's amazing. And so, but, but wise leaders in the church will make any adjustments necessary and they will bring in additional ministries to strengthen the church. And when pastor brings in other ministries to preach to us, to teach us, what he's doing is he's helping us maintain balance and effectiveness in all five areas. In one way, the fivefold ministry is kind of like the personality spectrum that, that people can have more than one emphasis. Uh, sometimes a, a pastor may uh, travel somewhere and may function in that place or in that area or in that country as an evangelist. And, and so he hasn't changed his basic essence. He's just put on an extra role for that. And, and God is, see, it's not about that pastor. It's about God. It's about the giftings. It's about the fivefold ministry. It's about the church. And, and then sometimes you'll find that uh, not only do people uh, exercise more than one, uh, but they'll exercise different giftings or different roles at different times. And then if you add to that, there's the gifts of the Spirit. It's not just leadership in the apostolic church that functions in the gifts of the Spirit. We hope not because we need saints of God that embrace the gifts of the Spirit and somebody can be used to pray a prayer of faith. Somebody can be used to give a message in tongues. Somebody can be used in the gifts of healing because pastor's only one guy in one place at one time and so he can't do all of that. And, and furthermore, it's a witness not only to believers but to unbelievers when people that are just like ordinary folks like all of us that they're used in gifts. So there's, there's, there's the fivefold ministry, that's leadership gifts. There's, there's the gifts of the spirit, there's the fruit of the spirit. There's all kinds of things that God has put in his body so we can have apostolic harvest and revival. 
So I want to look at these five gifts tonight. We're not doing a complete overview of, you know, all the gifts of the Spirit and everything. Tonight, I just want to help you understand what we call the fivefold ministry because this fall in our church... Uh, pastor has invited some ministries to come and preach here, and we're going to be exposed to some of the five-fold ministry again this fall. We have in the past, and we've been through COVID, which is kind of like going through purgatory, uh, and, and, and so we've been kind of cut off and isolated a little bit, and thank God that's starting to open up, and if you still want to, uh, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, I don't know, stay at home in your basement. God bless you. We're glad you're watching. Uh, I'm so glad to be out and about. And they make fun of me for saying it that way in the States, out and about. And you all say it the same way, so don't look down your nose at me. It's a Canadian thing. I, I was preaching on forgiveness in the States this past week, and I, I was talking about uh, the word saying, I'm sorry. Well, they just laugh. They bust out laughing when you say, I'm sorry. Because they say, I'm sorry. And I always tell them, well, sorry is what they wear in India for a dress. So if that's what you want to talk about, you go ahead. But I'm going to keep saying it right. Anyway. So I, I, let, let's go through what the Bible calls the fivefold uh, ministry. First of all, and we're going to do them out of order uh, just to upset the perfectionists. Um, so first of all, there's what I would call the relational dimension of the fivefold ministry. And this is where pastors are given to the church. Pastors, pastors are a gift to the body of Christ. We are so blessed here to have a great pastor and a great pastoral team that lead us and care for us and pray for us. And we're so blessed. It's, it's amazing. I'm so grateful. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, God said, I will give you pastors according to mine heart. I choose them, I appoint them, I anoint them, and they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And that's very key because Jeremiah is con comparing pastors to shepherds who feed the flock and protect it and lead it. Any effective New Testament church has to feed and care for its people in the way that a shepherd feeds and cares for a flock. In times of crisis, people like us, we have to have strong ties to other believers. Do not try to do living for God all by your little old self. That, that's a tragedy waiting to happen because God put us in a body. He put us in a family and we need other believers for support and for guidance and for strength. So again, these five individuals, uh, these, these giftings, God uses individuals. So for our congregation, God has given us Pastor Jack Lehman, and, and we're so grateful for that. But it's not just about him. It's not just about, well, now we're covered in the pastoral area because God gave us a pastor. It's not just that. Because these gifts are not only given to certain individuals, they are given to make sure that the church never forgets certain initiatives. And pastors are the ones who challenge us to ask a lot of questions. And you'll notice this about pastor. He's always challenging us. He's always making sure that people are, are, are loved and people are cared for and that we are loving and caring for each other like a genuine family. Pastors challenge us to ask questions like this. Are new believers following the Lord? Are our new believers growing in Christian disciplines? Are people that are in need, are they receiving practical help? Not just, well, yeah, I'll pray for you. Pray in hands emoji, uh, happy face emoji, heart, 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 uh, fire, 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 prayer, prayer, prayer. It's more than that. It, it's, it's like they actually are helping people uh, with needs in the body of Christ. And pastor is concerned, and, and I've, I've listened to him in staff meetings uh, go through lists and, and he's concerned, you know, and he, he brings this question to the table. Are people falling through the cracks or are they backsliding or are they disconnecting? Because that's the heart of a pastor. That's that gifting of pastoral ministry that God uh, gives to the church. Uh, he, he's concerned about are people establishing real friendships with those who are new. It's easy to be friends with somebody that you've known for 75 years. That's easy. If you're not friends by then, you really need to get a new social circle. 
But here's what's hard is somebody that you've only seen around for seven and a half weeks. That's more challenging. And you feel sometimes like you don't have a lot of common ground or, or maybe you're one of those shy people or you've got your thousand excuses. But see, pastor, he won't let us go on that because he knows that churches don't grow from the inside out. Churches grow from the outside in. If a church doesn't have new believers coming, if a church, you know, we, we, we grow from that messy fringe where people are still addicted and people are still living in sin and people have still got some bad habits and people don't have a real clue about what Pentecostalism is. And that's wonderful because that's how churches grow. And But if nobody that's in the middle ever reaches out and makes a friendship or, 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 or prays or connects, then it's, and so pastor won't let us go on that. And, and that's his job. That's his gifting that God gave us our pastors to make sure that we never forget that initiative of being a, a, a pastoral kind of church that shepherds and feeds and cares for people. It's so very important. Now, here's my last statement and we'll move on. Pastoring a church takes more than the pastor. Pastoring a church takes more than the pastoral staff. Pastoring a church takes more than the paid employees of the church. Pastoring is shepherding. Pastoring is caring. Pastoring is loving and connecting and, and, and leading. And so pastoring, guess what? Takes all of us, but God gave us a gift to remind us of that kingdom initiative. The fivefold ministry is not about an individual that we put on a pedestal and say, well, there, he does that. No, the fivefold ministry is an individual, a gifting that God puts in the church to remind the rest of us that we're not just spectators. We're participators. That's very important. And then we move on. So that's the relational dimension of the fivefold ministry. And then there's, uh, we'll call it the educational dimension of the fivefold ministry. And this is where teachers are given to the church. Uh, and God gives teachers. Now, I, I tell people all the time, I, I grew up in New Brunswick. Um, and I know what they used to say about teachers years ago because I was a kid. Uh, my dad was a teacher, and I was actually a little scarred by this and a little slightly offended, and, but I got over it. Um, people used to say, if, if they would say about a particular man, he's a teacher. What they meant was, he's a dreadfully boring preacher. That's what they meant. And so they'd say, he's a teacher. And you just wanted to run and scream and hide because you knew what they meant. And uh, it was especially bad if they said, he's a teacher, bless his heart. It was, the, that's a pathetic teacher. It was just awful. I, I grew up with that. I knew that. Uh, but, but that's not biblical because God gives teaching and teachers. He gives that gift to the church. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and all scripture is profitable. And here's where teachers kind of cut their teeth and where they add to the, the body of Christ. Scripture's profitable for doctrine, what to believe, for uh, reproof, uh, what not to believe for correction, how not to behave, and, and for instruction in righteousness, how to behave. So, so there's this whole grid that teachers just, they get all excited about that and they love to teach the word of God. But again, fivefold ministry is not about just a certain individual that you say, well, now that's covered. No, it's about that individual being gifted uh, to bring to the church's attention, we need some of this in the church. It's a kingdom initiative. An effective New Testament church helps people understand God's word and how to apply it. In the Hebrew language, teach and learn are the same word, basically. Uh, teach and learn. So teaching isn't about just hearing a sermon on a Wednesday night. Teaching is about doing the word. So teachers, just like pastors, teachers challenge us to ask some questions of our church, of ourselves, of the way we're doing this in our city. Are we presenting scripture in a way that is creative and compelling and understandable and convicting? Or are we just kind of talking in Pentecostal buzzwords all the time? Teachers want to know and they help us ask, are saints in the church, are they applying biblical principles in their personal lives? Or are they just coming to service, doing some religious activity and going home unchanged? 
Uh, is false doctrine being challenged and corrected? And I got to tell you, there's a boatload of false doctrine floating around in the last of the last days. And so that's teachers. They keep it in front of us. We need to confront and we need to challenge and correct false doctrine. And uh, here, here's another question that teachers, they just can't leave us alone on this. Are we living out God's word in such a way that sinners actually notice and they want what we have? Because if you're one of those incognito apostolics, you're not helping us much out there where it matters. Are we living out the word of God? Have we been taught the word of God enough that we're living it out and people notice it and they want what we have? Here's a question that teachers help us with. Uh, are we doing more teaching than in the pulpit on Wednesday and Sunday? Are saints engaged in home Bible study opportunities beyond the walls of the church? And you know... Uh, Pastor, teacher, a lot of scholars think that's kind of a joint role. And very often pastors will flip over into that other gifting. And, and so pastor's been after us. You know, we can teach on Bible studies. He asked a bunch of you and you, you responded. I'm so proud of you. I, I would be involved in teaching a home Bible study. That's so important because teaching isn't about this. Teaching is about reaching the world with the Bible, with the scripture, with the message of salvation. And just like pastoring, teaching is a team effort. It's not just, well, yeah, we got that covered. We know this guy and he's a teacher. We know that lady and God gifted her. She's a teacher. No, it's about a kingdom initiative. So God gives the gift. It's often given to an individual or through an individual. And we call them the five-fold ministry. But the five-fold ministry is about a kingdom initiative. Pastoring, looking after people, caring for people, loving people, shepherding people. That's one of those initiatives. Teaching people, training people, building people up, maturing people. That's another kingdom initiative. This next one is fun. It's, it's really fun. Um, it, I, I called it because I didn't have another word. I had relational and I had educational and this just seemed to fit and I know some of these guys and so it really fits them. Uh, the confrontational dimension. The confrontational dimension. Uh, this is where we have people called prophets and there are prophets today just like there were in the New Testament and just like there were in the Old Testament. And I, I searched through the scripture for a verse, you know, pastors and teachers are always doing that, a verse that would just kind of summarize what a prophet's all about. And I found one. It actually comes from the Old Testament uh, from the reign of old King Ahab, who was as backslidden as backslidden could be, uh, wicked and evil and, and worldly. And, and, but he, he was going out to war one day and uh, he was going out, I think it was Jehoshaphat, he was going out with uh, the king from the other uh, section of Israel uh, during that time of the divided kingdom. And so they're talking about going out together to war against a joint enemy, a common enemy. And so the other king, he says, I think it's Jehoshaphat, he said, I don't want to go out without a prophet giving us a word. And do you have any prophets kicking around? And Ahab says, well, we got that guy, Micaiah, but I don't like him. He always speaks the wrong thing. He always speaks negative stuff. He always tells me that I'm doing something wrong. Well, that's really kind of the role of a prophet a lot of the time. And so here's the verse I found that kind of sums up the role of a prophet in the fivefold ministry. This is amazing. Uh, and Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. If God tells me, I'm going to say it. If God puts it on my heart, you're going to hear about it. If God just tweaks it in my mind, I'm going to blurt it out right in the middle of church. That's a prophet. And I know some, some wonderful people that are literally prophets of God. And boy, when they show up, they're intimidating. Their eyes can flash fire. You think they're mad at the whole world sometimes. But they have such a passion to declare and deliver what God is speaking to the church. And God gifts them. But it's about more than them. See, this is where the five-fold ministry, people can have all kinds of misconceptions because they want to make a superstar out of that. And you actually have people that hardly pay a, a lick of attention to their pastor who God's put in, in, in covenant with them in the local church. They hardly pay attention to their pastor, but they will chase all around. They'll buy a motorhome and chase all around the country to follow some prophet somewhere. That's not the will of God. 
That's not authentic five-fold ministry. The five-fold ministry isn't given so somebody can have a calling card and a billboard. The five-fold ministry is given to build up the church and to equip the saints. And prophetic gifting is part of that. And prophetic gifting can be a little confrontational. Uh, every New Testament church, they, they need to pursue the presence of God I was so, I just get overwhelmed a little bit emotionally sometimes uh, when the presence of God moved in here tonight uh, so beautifully. Every church needs the presence of God. Every church needs services where God just sweeps in uh, like he did on Sunday and, and just we can't even hardly explain what just happened, but we know God's power is present and God's power can meet every need. So here's, here's the thing, I want you to get this. It's not the presence of a prophet that's important. And it's not even the presence of a prophetic word that is the goal. The goal is the manifest presence of God that changes everything. But a prophet can often speak a word from God that snaps us to attention and makes us realize what's going on in the supernatural realm. So prophets are always challenging us to ask questions that are really uncomfortable, questions that are quite awkward, questions that are quite in your face. Prophets ask stuff like, are you saints on fire for God or are you just sitting there? Are sinners being convicted and converted? Are people receiving the Holy Ghost in our altars? Are we praying the prayer of faith for healing and deliverance? Are there moments in our services that we can't even explain by human means? Here's a prophetic question. Are we actually giving God time to move or are we just kind of going through the program and the routine and the schedule? Are we seeing signs and miracles and wonders and the supernatural? See, the prophetic is always challenging. It's never comfortable. If you're real comfortable with the message, that probably wasn't a prophet. It might have been a false prophet. Prophets, they get in our face and they shake their finger under our nose and they tell us, and, and we've got some prophetic giftings that are gonna be here at our church. And, and, and can I just tell you, um, as, as one of the pastors here at CCC, don't be resistant to prophetic ministry. Embrace it, open up your heart to it. Let it challenge you, let it convict you because prophetic gifting is given to the church so we never forget that prophetic initiative. Without the supernatural, we're just another church on another street corner with a different doctrine. But with the prophetic, with the supernatural, God can do anything and he uses those individuals with a prophetic anointing to remind us it's not about the individual it's about the initiative of the kingdom that we've got to be a prophetic church we've got to have words from God that are spoken in our services through the gifts of the spirit we got to have our pastor anointed enough that he knows to just stop in his tracks and say not going to preach this morning we're just going to move into the altar we've got to have that in our services and I know you want it because I know most of you, but we forget and we get comfortable and prophets are sent from God, the five-fold ministry to stir up the church. But it's not about the prophet. That's, that's where people get weird ideas about five-fold ministry. It's not about that guy. It's not about him. It's about you. It's about the church. It's about the kingdom initiative of, of, of confronting the flesh and confronting worldliness and confronting, I think this is the big one, confronting apathy and comfort and laziness. Is there anybody besides me that would admit it's really easy to coast spiritually? Once you've known the Lord for a while, you know all the ropes. Somebody new, they come in and we just blow their hair back. But you, you're used to this. You've done this for some of you for years. And so we're used to this. And every once in a while, we need a prophetic voice to say, church, we can do better. We can go higher. We can reach longer. We can reach further. We can, we can do this. And we need those gifts given to the body. And then there's this one, um, the invitational dimension, the invitational dimension. And this is where God gives us evangelists. An evangelist is not a preacher that travels around, flies on airplanes, comes in with his suitcase and his briefcase. 
and, and just talks to the church. That's not an evangelist. That actually is probably more like a, a prophet if he's got that gifting. An evangelist is someone that is specially gifted to reach the lost. That's what an evangelist is. Mark chapter 16, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So every effective New Testament church is committed to sharing the gospel with everybody, regardless of barriers. It doesn't matter who they are or where they are. Now, pastor knows this and he's doing this for us. It's good to schedule evangelists to come and preach. It's good. But it is better to allow those giftings to develop a culture of evangelism in our church. Because we can't have an evangelist fly in for every single service of every single year. But what we can do is we can grow a culture of reaching people in our church and among our saints. And, and so evangelists, they challenge us to ask questions. Evangelists will challenge you. And some of them challenge you just by what they're doing and what they're accomplishing. Our saints personally engaged personally engaged in the Great Commission. Is reaching lost people a top priority in our church programs and in our church services or are we just kind of hanging out and fellowshipping among ourselves? Are saints taking advantage of every opportunity to share Jesus with people in between Sundays? We all know that you love Jesus because you tell us on CCC members. But CCC members is an echo chamber of apostolic. We talk to ourselves. We pray for ourselves. We share wonderful things. It's all good. I'm not criticizing it. It's wonderful. Thank God for CCC members. God bless Facebook. And Mark Zuckerberg. God bless him a little more. A few more billions. Yeah, go ahead. But that's an echo chamber. You know what would be better for your church is if you took all of those wonderful compliments about your church and your pastors and your preachers and your services and what God did and put them on your public Facebook page where the world can see it. But what if they see it? That's the point. That's the point. We already know. We already know you like Pastor Jack's preaching. But what if you said, my pastor preached this message and it changed my life and somebody out there could read it. Wouldn't that be cool? Hmm, no, you don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Keep echoing. That's great. Our saints taking advantage of every opportunity to share Jesus between Sundays. Our, here, here's something that happens in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Are we just waiting for people to come and see? Is that our model? Or are we doing what Jesus said, his command to go and tell? There's a big difference between, you know, we're going to sit here. We're going to be here. We'll be here next Sunday. We'll be here the Sunday after that. Come and see. Or we go and, and tell. That's, that's different. The Great Commission is Jesus' top priority. So the question is, is it our top priority? Here's a worse question. Is it your top priority? That's the question. Uh, since that one's uncomfortable, let's go one more step and we'll be done. Finally, there's the motivational dimension of the fivefold ministry. And this is a role called apostles. Um, I believe that there are apostles. I know some of them, and I'm blessed to know them. Uh, the, the Greek word is apostello, apostello, and it means a sent one. Uh, here's what Paul said in Romans. Uh, and how shall they preach except they be apostello, except they be sent. That's, that's where we get the word apostle, a sent one. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Any effective New Testament church constantly is trying to multiply leaders and multiply new ministries and ultimately multiply new, more growing churches. I'm so grateful that we've had a hand in um, Pastor Mike and Kathy are in Oromukto, um, Pastor Jason and Eliana uh, pastored in Guangzhou, and we still have a work there even though they had to leave because of the politics there in China, but we have a church that's still going and growing there in Guangzhou, China. 
Um, I'm so grateful for Pastor Justin and Grace in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, they had a couple people receive the Holy Ghost on Sunday. And Pastor Justin said one of them, uh, his name was Yoko, I think. Uh, uh, and, and he didn't want to leave. He received the Holy Ghost and he didn't want to leave. Uh, Justin was still, when he took the picture and sent it to me, he was still sitting in their little cafe long after church was done because this guy didn't want to go home. He just wanted to soak up the Holy Ghost in that place. I'm so thankful because that's what an apostolic church is supposed to do. It's not just about here. God's blessed here. This is one blessed little piece of acreage in the city of Fredericton. This is one blessed little campus and a blessed little collection of buildings. We've been abundantly blessed. Pastor told us tonight, all of this is paid for because of your faithfulness and God's faithfulness. Because if it wasn't for God being faithful to you, you couldn't be faithful to give to his kingdom. But aren't you grateful for the goodness of God? But it's not just about this. It's about extending and expanding the kingdom of God. Without a missional focus, both next door and around the world, the church is incomplete and ineffective. So apostles, sent ones. You could almost in modern vernacular substitute the word missionaries here because missionaries go to new territory, new countries, and they open up things for the kingdom. So definitely many missionaries are uh, apostles in that sense. We're privileged in New Brunswick. Benny de Merchant was an apostle to Brazil. Yeah, he was a potato farmer from northern New Brunswick that learned how to fly planes so he could be a crop duster. And God had different plans and took him to the nation of Brazil. And there are tens of thousands of believers in Brazil today because of a guy from New Brunswick who liked to fish in the Tobik River and whatever else up there in Carlton County. And, 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 but, but he was an apostle. Our friend Alan Shaw is an apostle to Asia. I debate you to the wall on that one. I've watched him and, and that authority God has given to him. But it's not just about those individuals. Those individuals are given those gifts so that we can stir up the church to have uh, initiatives, kingdom initiatives. And so apostles always challenge us. They ask irritating questions like this. Are we mobilizing new leaders? Are we developing new ministries? Or are we just maintaining the status quo? Apostles will ask questions like this. They may not even put it in these words, but when you're around them, you know they're looking at you and you feel the pressure and it's good pressure. Do we feel that planting new churches is an obligation? Or is it just some kind of option that some do and some don't? Are we sharing our church's people and our church's resources beyond our own four walls? That's a question that apostles will challenge you on. Are we engaged in missions beyond just giving money to missionaries? I thank God for the faithful saints of this church that have allowed this local congregation uh, to, to become one of the top giving foreign missions, global missions churches in our entire fellowship. But missions is more than just putting a missionary offering in an envelope. Missions is about more than that. And apostles challenge us. Apostles remind us that truly apostolic churches are not just seating facilities. They are sending churches. They are sending facilities. And so every time that uh, one of our pastors when Pastor Jack is out ministering, when Pastor Matt's out ministering, Pastor Alex is out ministering, when one of our pastors is out there, that's our investment in the kingdom of God somewhere. Uh, Pastor Matt was in Montreal. Uh, they're hardcore in Montreal. Oh my goodness, I can hardly keep up with them. Um, Brother Cahosi's church, you just know it's going to be workload. It's, it's Judon Workload Cahosi. That's, that's who he is. Uh, he just goes like 1,000 miles an hour. And uh, they were out at some, uh, uh, I won't tell on Pastor Matt and somebody from Montreal if you're watching, God bless you. Um, it was kind of a primitive uh, youth camp uh, facility out from the city. Uh, uh, Matt told me about uh, the, the lack of uh, consistent running water uh, and far worse for me, uh, the lack of internet. Um, it just, you know, but they had like eight or nine people baptized in Jesus' name and 14 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And see, what that is, is one of our pastors 
putting on the mantle or the gifting of an evangelist because, again, it's not about this is your role and you get credit for this. It's about those giftings being given to the body and the body is reminded we've got to have apostolic mission at our core. We've got to have evangelism in our hearts. We've got to have teaching so we're strong and so we believe the truth. We've got to have pastors that challenge us to care for all the new believers that are coming to us. And we even have to have prophetic voices once in a while to challenge us and stir us and kind of make us uncomfortable so that we can get back into alignment apostolically. And that, my friends, that, brothers and sisters, is a very simple lesson, but I hope it's a helpful one on the fivefold ministry because the fivefold ministry is never just about certain individuals and we say they got it covered we will sit here and applaud and we will put them on a pedestal that's very dangerous that's not biblical at all the fivefold ministry are five leadership giftings given to every apostolic church to remind us of five kingdom initiatives that we need to commit to, we need to be involved in, we need to figure out what it looks like for us to follow a pastor, for us to heed the word of a prophet, for us to be motivated by the gifting of an apostle or the calling of a missionary. We need to figure that out in our individual personal lives. And when we do, the saints do the work of the ministry and the body of Christ is edified. And when the church gets stronger, the church gets bigger. And when the church gets bigger, that's not more perks, that's more people. And more people are more eternal souls. And that's why we do all of this. And that's why I'm so grateful for our church and for all of you. And I hope something in that tonight is a helpful or it answers some questions or it clears up some confusion because it can get messy when human beings try to define apostolic ministry and giftings in terms of a modern North American celebrity culture. It can get really wacky really fast. But thank God there is a real biblical apostolic fivefold ministry and there are real apostolic gifts of the spirit that function in the church and there is the fruit of the spirit that's real that's in the scripture it functions in the church and then all of the saints of God they are the core because the kingdom of God is measured not in apostles or prophets or pastors the kingdom of God is measured in saints because on that final day, that's where we all stand. We are saints of the most high God. Our lives changed by him. Aren't you glad to belong to an apostolic church that, that really makes an effort to follow the teaching of scripture? Would you stand with me tonight? If you've been watching online, thank you for watching and uh, interacting with our service tonight. Would you lift up your hands right now and please uh, take a little admonition and don't give me a two-second dismissal praise. Uh, what I'd like you to do is just begin to pray and say, God, uh, there, there's some areas there that, that Pastor Raymond talked about that I, I think I need to be challenged. I, I think I need to be stirred. Would you just lift up your voice for a second and pray just like that right now?